Okay, everyone, I think we are live. <sighs> Welcome to a very nice and warm desert, California desert evening. Uh, tonight we've got a little bit of puffy cloudiness here um, and a few high thin clouds floating overhead. So um, that may make our image is a bit fuzzy here and there, but uh, I think we should be uh, fairly good to go here, so let me just get this started up here, and uh, let's get us on, all right, so right now we are on my um, my focusing star, I guess you could say. First star of the night is, uh, this is actually Vega. So we're on Vega right now, which is the star I use to, to do my focusing of my camera and uh, check the collimation. So um, I think, well, since it's so close by, I don't think, I, let's just do, start off with the ring nebula. It's right there, right close at hand. So we'll just pop over to that. That's a fun little planetary nebula, one of the brightest ones in the sky. And uh, tends to be a fun one. So let's see if we can get this into the view. Stretch that, and there it is right in there dead center. That's pretty cool. So we'll reset this, and we'll stretch out our exposure to maybe eight seconds or so. And get my uh, my correct dark going on that because I do have an eight second dark. And start our stack. And we'll start some eight second. 8 second subs on the Ring Nebula. I'll zoom in a little bit here so you guys can see. It's a very bright, pretty little planetary nebula. And uh, it's a good one to start off on. Let me do a little bit of adjusting here to get things a bit brighter. Maybe it's a little too bright. Quick histogram adjustment to get the colors into line. And we'll see how that goes for a bit. But this is a bright, a bright little planetary nebula, and once we uh, pull some stacks together on it, pull some frames together, it uh, the center will actually darken a little bit and we'll actually see a center core the central core star of this planetary nebula and for, for those of you who haven't uh, haven't uh, been with me before and uh, don't know much about what a planetary nebula is a planetary nebula is basically a star not unlike our own star that is nearing the end of its life and when it gets near the end of its life it actually starts dissipating some of its um, ionized gases into into the surrounding solar system into the surrounding area and um, but the star doesn't actually go out so it kind of blows off layers of its outer gases but it keeps glowing and so it illuminates all of those gases as they expand and so it creates a a disk or a blob in space and uh and that's they're they're called planetary nebulas because when our astronomy pioneers long ago first discovered them they didn't have very powerful telescopes but they had powerful enough telescopes to tell that this obviously was not a star it obviously was a disk and it had color to it and so they knew that it was not a star 
And so they assumed, like the other planets they had found, Jupiter and Saturn and Mars and the other and Venus and the other planets that were in the sky, they assumed these were also planets. And so they called them planetaries. And subsequently we've figured out they are not actually planets. They are actually other stars well outside our own our own solar system. <coughs> I think this is just a few thousand light years away. But uh, I'm not sure. So I am going to look it up. Look it up. Wikipedia is our friend. And let's see, first discovered by Charles Messier while searching for comets in 1779. <laughs> okay, that's how big it is. It's 2,600 light years away. Okay, 2,600 light years. So the light we are getting from it right now is left there 2,600 years ago. Is one th one reason that uh, some people say astronomy is like looking back in time, because you're literally looking back hundreds, if not thousands, if not even millions of years, depending on what you're, we are looking at. And uh, this one's 2,600 light years away, which puts it well within our own. Milky Way galaxy, um, but we have, like all these objects that are really, really far away from us, which is almost everything outside of our solar system, we have no idea what it looks like today, because it takes the light so long to get here, all we see is the light that left a long time ago. Uh, let's see. Sometimes I actually also, I, I don't even do this at eight seconds. Sometimes it's actually better to do it at four seconds because um, at eight seconds it actually kind of blows out the core of it, so um, it just stays really bright in the center. But even though, th even through that, you can kind of see that there's a a bit of a central star in there, and uh, but the but the center is a little bit blown out because I've got uh, I've got the exposure a little high. So let me try. Just doing a little histogram adjusting and see if I can't darken things up just a little bit. Let's bring that core out. Hi. <laughs> but it's yeah, it's kinda hard to kinda hard to see. So I actually just might start the stack over again. I started at four seconds. So let let me in fact do that because eight seconds is turning out to be a little too much. So let's stop the stack and this time I'll actually name it so I can save a record of what I saw here and uh, drop to four seconds. Put the correct dark in. And then start the stack over again. We'll erase the old one and put in the new one. Yeah, see in here we're already starting off with the, the central part of the nebula a lot darker. So this is going to actually be a lot better because this is going to show show things a lot better. It'll show that central star a lot better once we can uh, stack a few a few sub exposures on there, which won't take long given that they're only four second exposures. So far tonight, the breeze is calming down, which it was supposed to do, which is a good thing. Still, a little puffs of breeze here and there, and like I said, there are. 
there are some high thin <coughs> high thin <coughs> high thin clouds up there a little bit um, that may wander around and partially obscure what we're looking at now and again but uh, By and large, I think it's going to be pretty good. All right. Yeah, it blows it out a little too much. Yeah, we'll just keep going here. Oh yeah, I know I forgot to put a little sharpening on it. That always helps. Makes it a little more noisy when you add sharpening, but it also makes everything just sharper, the stars and all the objects. So it is a little bit of a trade-off, but I find it worth it. Oh yes, and I gotta remember, <laughs> interesting thing about doing these live streams is that uh, when I make it look right on my screen, it's too dark for you guys. And so I've gotta remember to make it a little too bright for me so that I can see so that you, you guys get to see it a little bit brighter which is also why I have two screens on here because it uh, I can monitor the stream in my second computer on the second on, on this case a second computer not just a second screen and uh, so I get to see what you guys see there is a <laughs> uh, about a good 30 second or so delay between what I do on my primary machine and what actually comes across in the stream. So, um, but uh, that way I can monitor what you guys are seeing and remember, oh yeah, it needs to be bright because otherwise you guys can't see it very well. But I think you can probably st just start to see a little of the central star that's in there. It's in the very core. One of the things I'm uh, using for the first time tonight is a new coma corrector, um, which makes all of the stars pretty much pinpoint all the way to the edges. So um, the stars in the middle are pinpoint, and then coma is when you start getting to the more outer reaches and corners of the image, the stars will all start to streak in an outward direction from the, from the center. And that's, uh, that's coma and uh, that usually happens with fast optical telescopes like the one I've got and uh, which is great for imaging but causes those little aberrations uh, visual aberrations so you get a coma corrector which flattens the field and makes it uh, all pretty much sharp to the edge and looks like it's doing a pretty good job tonight last night it was a little bit off and I think I might have had it partially crooked inside the inside the focuser when I put it in. So it looks like it's doing better tonight. But you're starting to be able to see that central star now popping out a little bit. And if you say, and if you feel like it, looks like we got about six people watching right now. If you feel like it, type a little something in the chat and say hi. Let me know you're out there. While I can see the number of people that are viewing, I can't actually see who you are until you actually chat. Once you chat, then I can then I can see what your uh, at least your login name, your avatar name is on YouTube, and uh, I can tell who's there. But right, looks like we got a few people on. A little bit of a puff of breeze again.
degrees now. So as a result, some of my uh, we're dropping a few frames now because the uh, the breeze is making a blurry mess out of the uh, <laughs> out of what's coming in. Yeah, the stars are pretty fuzzy right now. So when we look at the individual histogram or the individual frames. The stars are kind of streaky, a little bit blurry because the uh, the breeze is making the exposures, make it is shaking the scope just a little bit and making the uh, making the images blur. And I have a filter set in my stacking software such that when that happens, uh, those blurry frames, those blurry sub-exposures are automatically uh, deleted. They're automatically ignored, I guess I should say. But, well, it's going to be a little breezy tonight, so we're just going to have to wait it out. Just gonna have to wait out the wait out the little puffs of breeze when they do show up now and again. That central star is starting to pop out a little bit better now. Clouds. It doesn't look like we have too much in the way of clouds, at least right above us. To the east I have so a bunch, but they're, uh, uh, we don't want to look over there anyway, because uh, what all I've got out there to the east is a bunch of uh, a bunch of light from the Las Vegas light pollution dome over there. So that's okay, the clouds can stay over there since I don't go over there. I think for our next target we'll head up. Head up a little bit. All right, I think we can probably bring this in a little bit over here. Darken that up a little. And it darkens things a little bit. Yeah, don't darken it too much. Remember, when you're broadcasting, Things need to be bright, or you guys can't see it so well. But it's starting to sharpen up a little bit. start to see that central star a little bit right in there kind of a fun object
That's pretty cool. Okay, I think that was a good thing to start on. I think nine minutes is probably about good enough for that. So we'll just save that one. All right. Uh, we're off to next. Let's head up a little bit and get up a little higher, which tends to be a little bit better. Well, let's see. Where are we? I suppose it's below. Okay. Well, we can try doing East Vale. Vale is a very fun thing to do, but it uh, it's kind of faint, and so normally I like to use. Um, turn this off. Turn off the stacking. I like to use. Um, fairly long exposures. 16 to 30 seconds is what I've been doing on it since I installed my new my new wedge so I can do longer exposures. Um, but in this breeze exposures that long could be a little bit of a problem. So we'll find out. There's that star right there, dead center. Okay. So that's probably about right, actually. I think we'll just leave it there. Let's see what we can do with a full 32 seconds. I don't know if we'll be able to do a, uh, an exposure that long, but we'll see what we can see. It's a faint, it's a faint, it's a large, faint, wispy, wispy target. Uh, this is um, a nebula that at one time probably was a planetary nebula that has since expanded. Uh, oops, and I need to name this before I do that. East, uh, East, Vale. Okay, now I'll go ahead and reset this. And we'll see what what 32 second subs will do on this. Ah, you can still kind of see the streamer of it running down through here. And we'll have to see how well we do with uh We'll have to see how well we do with the uh, <coughs> with the long exposures. See how well they uh, they take. Well, we've got two f two subs stacked so far, so that's a good sign. Let's maximize this in a little bit so you guys can see a little better. That's a fairly large object. My field of view here is a little over one degree square. So this thing is almost pretty much a degree in length. All the way from down here, all the way up here. It's a nice, sort of a nice bluish reddish wispy cloud. Kind of delicate like a veil, which is how it got lacy veil, like how it got its its name. So We'll see, uh, we'll see what we can do with this. So far, so good, actually. It's, uh, the breeze continues to stay light. We might be in luck. We might actually be able to get some of it pretty nicely. Do a couple of quick adjustments here. And yeah, bring it out a little bit better. I have noticed.
noticed within this area that some of the some areas of it are lighter. There are some gradients in here. The, the background color is much darker over here on this side than it is on this side. And I think actually part of that may be some light, some stray light coming in, but I think also part of it may just be that I need some uh, Uh, need to need to start incorporating what are called flats. Yeah, that's looking good. Need to incorporate what are called flats um, into my um, processing of these images. And what flats do is they take into account variations of light in your optical train. So the light comes in the end of your telescope and gets Refract, refracted or reflected, depending on the type of telescope that you're using, and uh, into the eyepiece. Well, not all mirrors or refractive lenses are perfect, so some of them transmit a little more light over here than they do over there, or they reflect a little more on this part of the mirror than on that part of the mirror, and you get some um, imbalance in the light gradient and how, and how light is transmitted in one area of the image uh, of your scope to the other. And of course when you're using a camera and taking an image, um, then that is picked up by the camera sensor. And then the camera sensor is another thing that can actually cause some of the issues. Some of the little pixels on the camera are more sensitive than other pixels perhaps. So it's another thing that uh, that can cause some variation and so you create something called a flat which is you basically put a perfectly even light source into the end of your telescope and it takes a monochrome image that tells the telescope how your how your image comes into the scope and is processed and it can tell which parts get more light and which parts get less and then when you apply that resulting flat to your incoming images, it automatically reduces the areas that are getting more light, increases the areas that are getting less, or some such thing, and completely balances it out. And uh, so you don't have the, the light gradients, the kind of thing that you see here, uh, which, which again, I think may be partly due to some stray light I'm getting from a neighbor's light, but um, I think it is also that I just need some flats. Um, so. Anyway, so that's why you're seeing some some gradients across here. Hey Gary, good evening to you. Good to see you. Uh, looking forward to your uh, your broadcast tomorrow night. That sounds like a lot of fun. Gary is uh, in San Diego, and he, uh, along with uh, Dave Decker, they are members of the San Diego Astronomical Association, and they do some live streaming events now and again, and he's doing one tomorrow night. They are doing one tomorrow night, and uh, looking forward to seeing what they're going to see. And uh, yeah, Gary, I'm enjoying the, uh, the 533. I'm liking it. Although I'm not understanding what... Uh, looks to me like my image is frozen here. I'm going to try recycling my page, refreshing my page. my stream here temporarily. Come on. Come back. Come on. For some reason the stream on my second computer where I'm monitoring the stream keeps freezing and the video just keeps stopping. <coughs> anyway, looks like I'm back. Uh, okay, Frank. Hi, Frank. Welcome. Looking to get started with some EAA, but I'm not sure what camera is best suited to my current gear. I have a Celestron Evolution 8, alt azimuth mount. I do have the f6.3 focal reducer. I was thinking the ASI 385MC, but wondering if I should just look at the 533. Well, interesting. You will see that uh, another person here, the other person chatting, is Gary Hawkins, and he has 
almost exactly the same setup you do. He is using a, a Celestron, uh, he's using a C8, which is an older version of the 8-inch the SCT that you're using, but basically the same exact optical device. Um, he's using it on an AVX as opposed to your Evolution, but it's the same scope. He's also using the F63 focal reducer. Um, and um, uh, right now Gary actually uses the 533. Um, which is the same camera I'm using right now, and uh, he seems to get some great results with it. So um, uh, I, th I think the five—you can't go wrong with the 533. Uh, the 385 is also is also nice. Uh, they're basically the same size pixels, same size resolution, but the 385 is a much smaller field of view. It's a much smaller sensor, and so. With your C8 at f6.3, that's a full that's a focal length of almost 1,300 or a little over 1,300 millimeters. So, um, with the small sensor on the 533, it's a pretty small window to look through. Like for instance, the image that I'm seeing right that that we're looking at right here uh, with me is um, this is on my my scope. The 533 that I'm using has an image size of about one degree, and um, with the 385, it'll be much smaller than that, probably even less than half a degree. So you wouldn't be able to see uh, the larger objects with it, um, but uh, the larger DSOs and things like this, uh, like what I'm looking at here. This is uh, this is uh, West Vale, um, and this is about a degree across. So you wouldn't be able to see all of this, but smaller objects certainly work fine for the 385. Um, but the 533 is um, you know, a much bigger sensor, and so you get a much bigger field of view for larger objects. So, uh, but either one, you can't really go wrong. Um, but Gary uh, probably would be a great resource. You guys should, you guys should chat. Yeah. So Gary says his C8 gets about half a degree by half a degree, which is what you would also get, Frank. Uh, does the 533? allow you to choose a smaller ROI. Um, uh, yes, uh, well, the, generally the ROI is chosen by the controlling software. In my case, I use SharpCap. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, you can choose a smaller ROI with a piece of software like SharpCap. Uh, I would imagine if you use uh, the ASI specific software, um, you probably also uh, could choose uh, to use a smaller ROI because all it's doing is basically ignoring part of the sensor, some of the pixels on the sensor. Um, but uh, yes, you can. <coughs> you can uh, choose a smaller ROI in software if you want to. Uh, although, if you're doing planetary, you typically don't need to choose a smaller ROI because when you're doing planetary, you need to use, you need to get rid of your reducer, the F63 reducer, and even go to a Barlow. So, on your C8 with a 2000 millimeter focal length, you probably want to use at least probably a 2x Barlow, which means you're at 4000 millimeters of focal length. And for that, your, your field of view is already really small without doing an ROI. Because as you go up in focal length, and as you go up, which then increases your magnification, essential magnification, effective magnification, your field of view gets much, much smaller. So you typically don't need to do ROI if you're doing planetary anyway, because your field of view automatically shrinks dramatically as your, as your uh, focal length goes up. Yeah, like Gary said, uh, my my little six-inch imaging newt has only about 600 millimeters of focal length, which is half of what you guys get with your C8 and the F63 reducer. So, um, <coughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, Gary and I are using the same camera, but my scope has half the focal length, so I get twice the field of view. He gets half the field of view, but double the resolution because he sees much, much deeper, essentially. He'd only see half this object, but see it much closer up, essentially higher magnification. Because, mag because effective magnification is your focal length, essentially.
But anyway, this is coming out pretty nice. <coughs> Well, glad to, uh, glad to, glad to be helpful, Frank. Like I said, you and Gary, you and Gary can chat there because he uh, he has basically the same the same OTA you have, and uh, is using the 533. So it's a pretty good setup. But this is coming out pretty nicely. We're getting to see really some of the nice nice little wisps here. Let me refresh this page again. For some reason, I'm not sure why it's doing this. For some reason, the uh, my uh, the video just keeps freezing on my monitoring machine. I'm not sure why that is. I've never had that happen before, but anyway, let me see if I can't brighten this up a little bit. It's still a little bit too dim for you guys. Got to remember that when I'm doing streaming, you gotta you gotta blow it out. <laughs> gotta make it. You gotta really. I gotta make it look so that it's almost blown out on my screen for it to be bright enough on yours. And right now, I don't know if you can hear the wind in my microphone, but the uh, the wind has definitely picked up a little bit here as it's as it's doing now and again this evening. I said we were going to get some breeze. Thankfully, it's a southeasterly breeze, which I am mostly screened from in my backyard because most of the house is to the the southeast of me. Um, but uh, but still. Oh, computer wants some food. Well, I know how to do that. I am prepared. <clears throat> well, yeah, the, um, yeah, when I say that the video is freezing, um, yeah, I mean on my monitoring machine, not on my controlling computer. On my controlling computer, everything is fine. When I'm controlling the scope and sharp cap and all that stuff, um, that's not freezing. But on my second computer, where I'm actually monitoring the live stream itself, for some reason, that keeps freezing. Uh, I don't know why that is, but it, uh, I, I can't, I'm not getting an updated image. I have to keep uh, refreshing it and, <laughs> and restarting it. I'm not sure why to come back to continue to monitor the the live stream. But anyway, a weird little problem. But this is starting to come out kind of nice. Of course, we've been on it for about 15 minutes, so it should be coming out pretty nice. But this is uh, uh, Westvale is the is the faintest is the faintest of the. Uh, of them. So you, this is basically the right hand side of what was probably a, a planetary nebula. Like we looked at the Ring Nebula M57 just a little bit ago. This is probably the remnants of either a planetary nebula or what's more likely a supernova where a star just literally exploded. And uh, and so this is the wispy gas that's left from it. In fact, so let's go. <coughs> let's go see what. What uh, Wikipedia has to say about it. It's a cloud of heated and ionized gas and dust. It is a supernova remnant. Yeah, it's a star. Is a, it's, its original star was a star 20 times more massive than the Sun, which exploded between 10 and 20,000 years ago. At the time of the explosion, the supernova would have appeared brighter than Venus in the night sky, which is pretty bright, and visible in the daytime, in fact. The remnants have since expanded to cover an area of the sky 3 degrees in diameter, 36 times the area of the full moon. 
Well, previous distance estimates have ranged from 1,200 to 5,800 light years. A, recommend, a recent determination of 2,400 light years is based on direct measurements. So it's only a couple of hundred light years closer than the Ring Nebula was. But yeah, so this is definitely the remnants of a supernova, a star that exploded hugely. And in fact, if we look at it, if we go into still our, still our uh, planetarium software, you can see this green part down here is the bottom part of it. You can see there's more gas and things in here. And then here's the top part of it. This is what this is East Vale, which is what we're going to go to next, which is actually brighter. But this whole area was a supernova that just basically blew itself to pieces and about between 20, 10 and 20,000 years ago. And so these nebula, this nebula that's here is what's left the gases, the ionized gas and dust that's left from it, but it makes for some pretty colors. <laughs> it does make for some pretty colors. <coughs> yeah, I'm glad the audio is holding up, Gary. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder if you can hear the wind in my microphone, as we are getting some puffs of wind here. But for some reason, I'm, I'm I'm not ignoring any stacks, even at 30 second, uh, 32 second subs. So um, I'm kind of surprised by that. I think my uh, my new peer and uh, my new peer and wedge is uh, doing a pretty good job, even in some wind. So I'm kind of surprised. It's doing better than actually I expected. <laughs> In fact, I should show you my high tech. Uh, where is my? Hmm, where is my explorer? It went away on me. Let me see. Uh, it's going to be in here and here and here. Desktop face. Yeah, so there is my new, put this back here, there is my new high-tech setup there. Basically the old concrete block pier. And uh, so these are concrete blocks. I just found, the, it's just scrap blocks I found that I had around. And um, I got a little construction adhesive between them. And then I handmade this wooden wedge here. Uh, and uh, the blocks and the wooden part stay outside permanently. So I can polar align the wooden the wooden wedge part and it stays polar aligned. The only thing I take in is the the telescope tube itself comes off the mount. The mount then comes off the top platform of the wedge and those are the two things that come in. Those are the things that need to be protected because they are, you know, they have electronics and things and so you don't want to leave those out in the, the hot sun or the rain or any of the weather. So those go in um, but the rest of it can stay outside, and if it rains, I just put a trash bag over the top of this just to keep the water off the wood, and the blocks, of course, don't care. So it's pretty much weatherproof. Um, but the biggest pain about using a wedge is that every time you set it up, you have to carefully polar align it, as well as star align the telescope and the mount, and it's, so it's kind of a pain to set up. But if you can leave it set up permanently and polar align the wedge part, then coming in and bolting the mount to it, which it just has some, I bought some hand knob bolts that bolt, uh, three bolts, and it's, it's there, the tube goes in, and then you're ready to go. So it, uh, it works pretty nice, and so I was, uh, you know, I just, I just finished building that a couple days ago, and last night was my first trial, and, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm surprised actually tonight at how well it's doing. Um, actually, my images look better tonight than last night, and tonight we've got wind, and last night I didn't. So, anyway, one of those small miracles that yeah, you just don't ask why. <laughs> Uh, am I using the cooling feature, Frank asks, um, and what he means by that is um, 
this camera is uh, is a professional level camera and so it has a built-in two-stage active cooler so that when you take longer exposures it keeps your sensor cool and keeps it from overheating and keeps it from getting really noisy and uh, and the answer is yes um, in fact I'll if I un if I go back to this uh, so you can see the bottom of my sharp cap screen here you see I have the cooler set at 10 degrees centigrade and it's right now at 9.9 .9 using about 11 percent of the cooler's power uh, so the cooler is running almost on idle because I'm almost at the target temperature even just being out here tonight uh, so it's not the cooler is not having to run much but I am running it honestly for short exposures like this cooling isn't really necessary and in fact if they made a 533 uncooled I would have bought it because I don't typically do very long exposures although now that I'm on the wedge I have the ability to do so um, but uh, because I have it um, I'm using it uh, one of the convenient features about it is that um, you can set your darks to um, the target temperature when you create your dark frames um, the dark frames are dependent on temperature you need to set your exposure and gain levels and things to be whatever you want but then uh, your target your temperature of your sensor is uh, what is important for the darks and so if you have an uncooled camera generally speaking you take darks every five degrees or so centigrade and then whatever temperature your camera sensor is you use the appropriate dark for the that temperature gain and exposure level when you have a cooled camera where you can set the temperature then your darks library can be much smaller because now I can have a darks library that's just 10 degrees C and I can use those regardless of what the temperature outside is because the camera is maintaining a consistent temperature instead of fluctuating with whatever the outdoor temperature is um, so that is a convenient thing about having the pro level cooled cameras although again it's it's not worth the extra expense to me so um, if they made an uncooled one I would have it but they don't so there you are in any event I think it's time to move on from East Vale or from East Vale and let's go do well, actually I called that East Vale didn't I it's not East Vale that's West Vale <laughs> All right. Well, there you are. There we go. Yeah, that one's West Vale, not East Vale. All right. Well, doesn't matter. Turn off the live stack and drop down to one second. Now we'll actually go to East Vale. tell the scope so I select it in my planetarium software and then just hit a keystroke and you can see my planetarium software actually controls the movement of the telescope which is very cool so I can just pick an object and tell the scope to go to it and it it actually does it okay let's make sure we are on here Ooh, look at how blurry that is <laughs> that's because of the wind. Okay. And chances are this is right, but let me just pull a few seconds here with a highly stretched image. And uh, yeah, there it is right there. Right in there. So actually, I want to come up a little bit. I actually want to come up a little bit. Come on. There we go. That's probably going to be pretty close. Yeah, so now it's up here. All right, well, we did pretty well before. Let's see if we can do it again. Reset our stretch, put us up to 32 seconds. And 
and see what we get. Although right now it is a little bit blowy here. We'll see. I'm really surprised we got we did as well as we did on on West Vale. It's not looking too bad. Let's go ahead and start it. I'll, I guess we'll leave it called East Vale since that's actually what it is. <laughs> Last time it was West, not East. Oh well. All right. We'll see what we can pull in here. Did I hear a rumor that a non-cooled 533 might be in their future? Um, yeah, I've heard that rumor too, and I think that's all it is, is a rumor. Um, I don't think that's actually... Um, I think actually, what did I read? Um, the reality is the 533 sensor is pretty noisy. Um, in fact, you want to... Um, you definitely want to use it with darks. Uh, use darks with it. Um, it is a pretty noisy sensor um, that if you don't use darks you get a lot of hot pixels. And so it seems to be pretty sensitive to temperature. And so because of that fact um, they probably will not release an uncooled version since it is a fairly noisy uh, sensor that is uh, sensitive to temperature. So I would suspect that you probably won't see an uncooled one, but who knows? ZWO has added um, anti noise, anti hot pixel circuitry to their um, anti amp glow, etc., circuitry to their cameras before. They may even be able to come up with something again, who knows? But uh, <coughs> Again, I lost the feed. All right, so yeah, we're coming up through a little bit. So this is this is actually East Vale now, um, and this is a little bit brighter, a little bit easier to see. Not quite as faint as its uh, westerly brother, but you can see again how big how big this is. It's just this is the outer reaches of the explosion of that supernova that happened all those thousands of years ago. That's how, I mean, this is, this is just a massive area of space that we're seeing here, just a massive area. So it just shows you how powerful these explosions are. Of course, the star was about 20 times the size of our own sun, 20 times, which is, you know, I don't know what, maybe even the, the half the size of our entire solar system, or even bigger. I don't even know. It's a it's massive, massive target, and uh, a massive, massive thing. And so when it blew, it uh, it blew off a whole lot of gas and dust and well, as Carl Sagan would say, star stuff all the stuff that we are made of, all the heavy elements, <laughs> all came from, all were all formed in stars. Everything except the lightest of elements like helium and hydrogen are all, um, are all stuff that uh, was created in stars. All the heavier elements were created in stars. And so our bodies are composed of mostly of those heavy, heavier elements. And so that's why as he put it, we, uh, as our, as our man Carl used to say, we are star stuff. We literally, the molecules, the elements, the atoms that are in our body, were literally formed in the stars. So, <laughs> Gary, you got you got clouds down there, huh? Uh, yeah, I guess it. It's not too bad up here. We had some high thin stuff. Um up here a little bit ago. They seem to have blown off though. Mostly just mostly just wind now. Yeah, Frank, I can uh, I can relate. I was actually born in uh, born and raised in northern New England, so um, I know what the northeast clouds are like. 
I know, it's very humid up there. Nice and green and very mosquito-y, but it's, uh, there's a reason for that. All those clouds and all that moisture causes all that stuff. So, yeah, our East Vale coming along nicely here. Stretch a little bit more, even. Back that blue off. That blue likes getting rambunctious. Yeah, that looks a little better. Yeah, maybe I'll give it a titch more than that. There. Back that blue off, and you get to see some of the red in there. That's looking better. Again, the stars aren't too bad, and I'm not losing any. I'm not losing anything to uh, to the wind, which is very surprising. Yeah, my FWHM numbers are staying are staying uh, staying good. And that's another handy feature of. Uh, I'll kind of talk about that feature a little bit in uh, in SharpCap. The uh, FWHM filter, which stands for Full Width Half Measure. Which basically is a way of determining it measures the the clarity of a uh, of a of a of an image, how clear it is, how sharp it is, and um, you can set this filter such that if if it comes in and fails this, if it has a really low sharpness, that means either a cloud is rolled overhead and fuzzed out your uh, your object or your telescope is shaking in the wind, in my case, uh, or something like that. Um, and if that happens, of course, if you put one of those one of those bad subs into your stack, it can ruin the whole stack because it makes the whole thing look smudgy. So with this filter, it automatically analyzes each sub exposure as it comes in, and if it gets a bad one, which I have at the level 10 here, if it gets a bad one, it automatically rejects it and doesn't allow it to come into the stack. But if it's a good one, then it allows it to come into the stack. So this is how I can tell if I'm getting some bad subs or not. And typically in the wind, you'll see some of these will be tall and red, and those are the ones that are ignored. In this case, it's actually not varying all that much, which is surprising. Um, I guess my mount is... I guess I did good building my mount. It would, uh, it's plenty sturdy, I guess, to do to do what I what I need, and it's not really getting buffeted by the wind too much. Although I know just from using the eyepiece when I when I set up the scope and uh, test the the collimation, I can tell that on this wedge currently the way it is set up. It's definitely a little bit more jiggly than it was when I had it on my strong homemade tripod and set up regular alt as on a level tripod. That was much stronger um, than it is now. So I know it's not quite as strong now as it was then, but clearly it's it's holding up to uh, clearly it's holding up to the breeze. So I'm liking that. Yeah, this is doing pretty well. <coughs> Take a little drink of water here. Out of my sippy cup with a straw. Because when you're wearing a microphone, regular tip back glasses or mugs or coffee mugs or cups or things don't work so well. Straws, however, work very nice. So I got my sippy cup. <coughs> yeah, that's coming in pretty nicely. Although again, you can still see that I don't have, if you look at the background sky color, you can see the bottom left, the background is much darker than the upper right. 
which still may be a little bit of stray light coming in, but I think it's just a, that I'm going to need to start playing with some flats. Playing with some flat frames because it's uh, also very likely that I just have an unevenly illuminated optical train where some areas of my mirror or my secondary mirror or my primary mirror or even some areas of my sensor, as I said before, are more producing more light than others. Of course, in this case, it could also be the star field is just there could be a gradient in the star field. As we get further to the lower left, the star field could also be thinning out a little bit. Because if you look on our, our map where this actually is, it's right in, Cygnus is right along the edge of the, the whole Milky Way is in here. So this is all part of the strip of the Milky Way coming right through here. So we're kind of right on the edge of a thick area of, of stars. So it could even be that as we get down here toward the edge, we're actually running out. There's more stars here than out here. So it could actually be that we're actually just seeing a little bit of a, of a thinning out star field. And as we get forward, murder, uh, further toward the upper right, we're actually looking more into the, the, the thicker arm of the Milky Way that we're seeing into and uh, or seeing through and uh, we're just seeing more stars because the stars are more dense in that area but I don't know I think I, I need we need to just take a look at a a uh, <coughs> we need to take a look at it as something that's well away from the Milky Way maybe we'll do that here in a little bit get something that's further away from the Milky Way then we'll be able to tell much better what uh, whether it's a, a flat, whether it's an illumination issue or just just a, a star field gradient. <sighs> yeah, doing pretty well. I still I still have not ignored any frames. Still, no subs are being ignored even with the intermittent breeze. So that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, Frank, that's what I'm thinking, too. Um, if it's consistent in one direction, it could be that I need flats, or it could be that I have some stray light coming in. Again, we'll be able to tell if I slew to another target in another part of the sky here, and, uh, and that goes away, then we'll know that it was either a stray light or a star field gradient, like possibly what's going on here, or I just need to run some flats. Anyway, we'll find out in a couple of minutes. Because I think we're just about done with this anyway. About 12 minutes is what I typically do. So I think we'll just kind of save this. And shrink our window up. That came out kind of nice. And we'll stop our stack and reduce us back down to a second so we can find our next target. <coughs> so actually, I think I want to want to head more to the southern sky a little bit here. M15 is nice. Kind of work our way there. M15 is a nice target. It's a nice bright. That's not M15. That's not what I'm clicking on. There we go, Pegasus Cluster. Yeah, let's slew a little bit more to the southern sky here. Kind of get out of the Milky Way band a little bit more. And uh, put some of our theories to, to the test here. Oh, that's not too bad. That's kind of dead center, isn't it? That's pretty darn good, in fact. Okay. Works for me. I think I'll only go to four seconds on this one. Because with big bright star clusters, usually more than four seconds and you're just blowing stuff out. So, 
let me pull the correct dark in for four seconds. And... 15. 15. Good. Start the stack. Clear out. East Vale. And see what we can see here. I did reset that. Yes, you are reset. Ha! Okay, we're not getting any histogram peak at all. <laughs> okay, well, at four seconds... Whoops, 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 whoops. That's not what I meant to do. Uh, yeah. Well, okay, I might just stop the stack here. So what we're seeing right here now is I'm getting no... Okay, now I'm getting a little bit of a histogram. Okay, we're getting a little bit of a peak. Well, let's see what happens. Clear this out. I don't know that we're going to see... I don't know what's going to happen with this. We may not be actually be getting enough light with such a, for, uh, such a short exposure. May not be getting as you know, what's probably happening is here, is here is all the blacks are just clipped, which is what happens if you get uh, if you don't have enough light coming in. The histogram peak is uh, completely off the left side of the histogram itself, so which means we're not getting enough light. So I may have to go up to eight seconds anyway. I may have to go to eight seconds anyway, just just to get me some more light in. Yeah, because see the histogram is just eh, we don't quite get a peak in there. All right, let's stop the live stack then. Go up to eight seconds. Let's see what we get for a histogram. Let's see if we see a histogram peak here at eight seconds. in the 8 second dark mm, well, let's see what we can do I don't know if we're going to get anything on this either let's see let's see what happens uh, yeah, looks like we're going to get enough of a peak at 8 to be able to do something. Okay. Let's let it build a few frames in. If you just get a few subs in here. See if we can't... Uh, looks like 8 seconds might do it. Maybe, maybe, maybe. We'll see. Uh, yeah, to answer your question, Frank, yes. Um, basically, darks are depending on, dependent on a few things. Uh, number one is exposure level, uh, exposure time. Number two is gain. Um, and then things like your your uh, capture area and the capture format you're using, <coughs> and also temperature. And so anytime you change any one of those things, you have to use a different dark. And so you end up taking several darks um, for uh, I'm also beginning to wonder if I need to check my focus. I haven't checked my focus in a while. And I'm thinking maybe I might need to. I might be a little. F well, I might be a little out of focus. Let's see where our. All right. Let's do a histogram. Let's pull the histogram peaks together here a little bit. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. 
again though I'm thinking we might not be entirely in focus. It's looking better. Well, the star out here isn't too bad. You can tell sometimes by the diffraction spikes if they're split, or like sp split ends on a hair. If these get split, that usually means your focus is off, but it's a little bit fuzzier than I than I like. Which could be the breeze, but I'm thinking uh, it's been a while. I mean, I've been going for I've been going for over an hour, and I haven't checked my focus, and that's usually something you want to do every hour or so as the as the evening gets cooler, because as the temperatures cool and your mirrors and your telescope tube and everything cools, your focus can actually change. And so I'm thinking maybe I need to go check my uh, check my focus. In fact, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So let's uh, zoom out here and go to a nearby bright star. I think Enif will probably work. It's right in there. Come on. You're not going to let me select that star? Really? Come on. There we go. Alright, let's drop to one second. And go find our star. Oh, we got to turn the live stack off. Okay, let's do that. Turn the live stack off, which I thought I had already done, but I still had it full screen, so that doesn't work. Okay, let's go to our star. And we'll center that star. And uh, that's pretty well centered, I'd say. Uh, let me zoom in on it. Zoom in real well on it. Yeah, that's not too bad, actually. All right, I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to take my microphone off here and put my Batnov mask on. And uh, maybe I can do that and keep the mic on, then you can hear what I'm doing. Okay, so I'm going to put a special mask over the mouth of the telescope called a Batnov mask, and it is a photographer. A photographer's trick for precisely for precisely uh, adjusting focus in an optical device, and uh, basically you see there are there is basically um, uh, you see the the diffraction spikes coming off the object, and there's basically the two outside ones form an X that go right through the center, and the center one is straight up and down. And so with the Batnov mask, what you want to do is make sure that the center one is right in the middle, that the straight up and down one is right in the middle of the other two. And uh, it looks like it's a little bit off to the left to me, so I'm going to go, now I'll have to take the microphone off because I'm going to go adjust it. So you'll be able to watch as I adjust it.
So that's about as good as I'm going to get it. Again, the breeze is uh, <laughs> the breeze is making things tricky because it's jumping all over the place. But I think it was off a tiny bit, but not much. The scope is actually pretty good at holding its its focus. Let's go back to the M15 again. Let's go back to M15 again. Eight seconds, I think, worked about right. And there we are. Okay. I wish I knew why SharpCap did this. Every once in a while, you go to pull up the thing the live stack tab and it's maximized in the window just spontaneously. I really would like to know why that happens. But anyway, look at that pretty M15. I don't know. I think it looks better. But maybe that's just because it's already the histogram is already pre-adjusted from last time. <laughs> So it's a little bit of a cheat, but that's okay. I'll take it. It's a pretty cluster, though. It's not the biggest and the brightest, although it's close. But it's, uh, it's a pretty cluster. Oh, see, there it goes again. It just jumps to the top of the screen. I don't know why it does this. Only some of the time, not all the time, just some of the time. I think we're about right. <coughs> Gary says, sometimes I'm seeing an issue when darks are added. I can't replicate it often enough to post on. The sharp cap forum. Seeing an issue when the darks are added. Hmm. Okay. I guess you'd have to say a little more about what exactly that issue is. What do you mean by issue? It's a pretty cluster. It is a pretty cluster. Make it a little bit bigger here. Although when you make it bigger, you make it blurrier, so make it look all pixelated. I do have sh yes I do okay how's this looking yeah see we did lose one <laughs> did lose one sub to bad FWHM but that's all right like it when it automatically eliminates some darks seem to send the histogram way left um yeah, I would expect that would be the case, um, because the dark darks are essentially eliminating a lot of the errant pixels, um, which would tend to overall make the image darker, which would make the histogram peak move to the left. So that would seem to be normal behavior to me, although I wouldn't expect it to move a lot. I would expect that it would move a little bit. You redo the dark and perhaps the new dark gives you a histogram in the middle. Hmm. Okay, so from the same type of darks, you're seeing different behavior when you redo the same darks. Yeah, that sounds that does sound weird. 
That does sound pretty weird. <clears throat> well, one thing I will say here, we're not seeing I'm not seeing a gradient here like I did before. Although we're not at 32 seconds of exposure here either. We're only at a quarter of the exposure we were there. So it may be that that gradient only shows up at longer exposures. I guess what we could do is, just for a test, do a few stacked frames on M15. Well, no. I think we should, rather than doing that test on this, which will blow the object out, let's just find a more faint object that requires the longer exposures in a dark part of the sky. Now we get two birds with one stone. It is a pretty, pretty thing, though. It is a pretty one. Yeah. So yeah, if, if you're if from the same darks, the same settings, <coughs> you know, unless you're changing settings after using a dark or something. But if you're if you leave the settings alone and you're creating different darks that are having completely different behaviors where they should have the same behavior, then that is something weird. Although I don't know what the heck would cause that inconsistency. I haven't experienced that myself, so I'm not sure what uh, what exactly would cause that level of inconsistency, but... Yeah. <coughs> Let's see. Maybe something a little bit further south, even. And we got galaxies in here, but. Mag 11. We got a few smaller galaxies in here. What do we got here? Helix. Ah, Helix, how high are you? Uh, well, you're almost 30 degrees. And what are, you, what are you at? 200? Yeah, so you're... Okay. Yeah, so you're just slightly west of south. So, that could work. We could go look at... We could go look at Helix next. It's probably about enough time on... Uh, on M15 anyway. Whoop. Probably about enough time on M15 anyway. Pretty cool looking cluster. Alright, live stack off. Back to one second. And let's go to the helix. See what we can see in the helix. That's a pretty good size too. I don't know that I've ever I don't know that I've actually ever imaged the helix. So this could be fun. Or if I did, it's been a while. Okay. I think those. Uh, I don't know. Well, let me try increasing again a couple of ticks here. See if I can see anything. What is the uh, surface brightness? Thirteen five. I should be able to see. Oh, there it is, right there. Okay, right there. Just for just for just for giggles though, I'm going to try. I just installed ASTAP, the plate solver ASTAP, and I am going to see if I can't. In fact, let me just go ahead. I'll give it a four second, and I'm going to just do a plate solve on this just just to try it out. It seemed to work okay last night. 
but oh, I'm just not seeing anything. Well, let's, I don't know if it's going to see anything. We'll find out. Yep, boom. Four tenths of a degree. Okay. Boy, Astap is really, when it works, it's nice. I think my problem that I was having before was simply that. Yeah, so now it's down here. Yeah, now it's right down there. So it's almost centered, but not quite. So it's right down, centered right in there. So I'd like to bring that a little bit more to the center. Come on. Okay, I think that'll work pretty well. Alright, let's turn off our super stretch. I'll uh, make sure we have the right darks in here. I don't remember what dark I'm using right now. Am I on the 32 second dark? No, I'm on the 8. 8, 16. Okay, I don't know what... I don't know where in that list it is, so you just use this. Okay, and this is Helix Nebula. Okay, well, I'm not seeing much there. Let me stretch it again to make sure. Oh yeah, you're definitely there. Okay, well, let's fire up our stack and see where we get to. <coughs> Yeah, I um, I struggled for the last two or three months with uh, with Astap, and uh, <coughs> um, and I just kept struggling with it. And then I realized that I have been continuing to install the same old version, and so <laughs> I realized that uh, maybe I should just install a new version because Han, actually, the 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 guy who is uh, um. I think that's his name, Han. Anyway, he's a, I think he's a Dutch. Anyway, he um, he updates it very frequently. It's a very actively developed uh, tool. So I just went and uh, last night downloaded the latest version and installed it. And you know, for the first time, I'm getting the joy that everyone else is getting, which is uh, it just works right out of the box. Just don't configure it. Just uh, don't try and configure it, just uh, install it and click the button and uh, I'll be darned if it doesn't work real well, so bring that blue into line. Okay. Uh, let's see what we can do there. Yeah, that's not too bad. Alright, we'll try stacking on the helix for a bit. It's a little bit faint at first, but we'll pull in some more. I can probably stretch it even more aggressively. Get it to brighten up a bit. <coughs> yeah. So now we'll see. Yeah, see, so now actually what you... Now we actually see much more clearly what we were seeing before. Not just a gradient but even some vignetting, where the corners are much darker than the middle. You can really see the, the light drop off, especially on the lower two corners. The light really drops off toward the corners and gets brighter toward the middle. And does seem to be consistently brighter up top in the upper right than it is in the lower, and in fact, than it is in almost everywhere else. So this is... This definitely looks to me like um, it's uneven field illumination, which is exactly what darks are designed to deal with. So, good test. Good test. This is also a good test of my coma corrector, too.
my my batter MPCC coma corrector, which I also am trying out brand new here, and it does seem to uh, keep the stars pretty round all the way to the edge, even at the default 55 millimeters. <coughs> though I have ordered some spacers so I can play with it a little bit try and dial it in even better <coughs> but yeah it's looking to me like I definitely do need to have some flats good to know good to know well that'll be the next adventure maybe uh tomorrow night or the night after or whatever when I come out next I'll try some try setting up for some flats <coughs> earlier although not tomorrow night because tomorrow night is Gary's show tomorrow night it's the Gary and Dave show tomorrow night live from San Diego what's the name of the park again Gary I know it's not Mount Helix this time you had a lot of fun there last month but um, it's some park I forget You'll, you'll tell us in chat in a minute. But uh, that's going to be tomorrow night at 7 you're doing that. So interesting to see what you'll be able to see from there. Wow. Yeah, it's interesting also how, how much this, uh, how much the vignetting and whatnot really shows up. Um, uh, when you go to the higher level exposures. I didn't really have much of this issue at 16 seconds, but at 32, definitely having it. Time for sippy cup again. Oak Oasis County Preserve. That's it. So Gary will be doing Gary and Dave will be doing their their show tomorrow night from Oak Oasis County Preserve in San Diego, which I assume is a darker spot than where he's at in his Bordel 8 backyard. Normally Gary does a does his streams from his Bordel 8 backyard, so I'm assuming this place will be a little bit darker. <clears throat> so hope that you uh hope that you have a much easier time tomorrow night than you did last month. <laughs> your uh your show from Mount Helix was uh it was entertaining to watch, but I know it wasn't entertaining to be there. <laughs> he just uh, Gary experienced almost every possible problem under the sun, technological and otherwise, weather problems, doing problems. <coughs> it, uh, <coughs> he just had, I mean, it's honestly the most important astronomical tool they had <laughs> there was a hair dryer to keep everything, keep, to dry the dew off all of the optics constantly and the computers and the sensors and the everything there <laughs> it was quite a uh, quite a thing to watch hopefully tomorrow will be uh, will be much easier on you As we as we put get more subs stacked on, the uh, the vignetting is the noise and the vignetting is reducing, but uh, it definitely definitely is there. And uh, when you uh, I mean you can probably imagine with without all this cloudiness here, with that gone how much nicer this will look if the whole thing, if the background of the whole thing was as dark as these lower corners are. Which is what adding the dark frames should provide. So that will be a good thing to have. But even so, you can still see some of the nice structure in Helix coming out here. Now let me in fact
fact, stretch that a little more aggressively for you guys, so you can, which will blow it out on my screen, but make it a better, bit better for you guys to see. <coughs> Brighten it up some. So you guys can really see it better. Yeah, you were dude up before you started, <coughs> dude up and screwed up and everything else. It, it uh, well, that's you know, that's uh, that's astronomy when you're near the marine layer. It's uh, you know, I used to live in Santa Cruz before I moved here to the desert, and uh, yeah, I mean, you're just anywhere where you're when you're under when you, when you're any any high humidity area, especially when you're near the marine layer. As you are, in, as you are on the coast down there in San Diego, you always have that risk of that marine layer moving in and swamping you. At best, it ruins your transparency. At worst, it soaks everything. <laughs> so, well, I guess at worst, it clouds up. But <clears throat> yeah, you can see in one and when I pushed it harder, when I did stretch push the stretch harder, it made the vignetting and the field illumination even worse. So now the upper right is really washed out in gray. It's almost bright. And the lower lower left is much darker. Yeah, flats are really going to help a lot, a lot. The object looks nicer, but the background looks a lot worse. Yeah, I was amazed your computers kept going, too. Well, well, I don't know. Actually, they kept going, but they also seemed to be locking up intermittently. Uh, you were definitely having some performance problems with them, and if I recall, your stream kept locking up, your your images kept locking up, and and it was, it was more than just your communications, because I remember, yeah, well, I remember specifically you were saying your mouse was constantly freezing, um, and uh, <laughs> your computer would just stop responding for brief periods of time, so everything kept running, but it definitely. Uh, it definitely took moments of pause. <laughs> anyway, I hope tomorrow night goes uh, a lot smoother for you. But just in case it doesn't, I will have extra popcorn ready for myself uh, to, uh, you know, just to uh, see what adventure you, uh, you go through next definitely popcorn worthy. Well, last month was definitely popcorn worthy. Yeah, he looks not coming out too badly. Boy, look at how that upper right is just glowing. The whole background is glowing. Interesting. I wonder if I'm picking up some. It could be that I'm picking up a little light too. <coughs> off something, but, eh. I mean, it could be my computer screens seeing a little... What I should probably do is, I don't have a a light shield slash dew shield on the front of... on the nose of the scope. And uh, with these... with the with this little imaging newt, the focuser is recessed quite a bit from the opening, but still, stray light can get in there, and I don't have it flocked. It's dark in color on the inside of the tube, but... I don't have it flocked, so there could be some stray light coming in, because I'm kind of pointing, not really over my computer screens here, but in the general direction. Yeah, I don't know, uh, in, in terms of your stream speed, I don't know that 60 FPS really gets you anything anyway. I mean, what, uh, you know, 
basically 30 FPS is more than fast enough to not see any flickering so <coughs> I'm not sure why people want to run at more than 30 FPS it just uses a lot more bandwidth and I'm not really sure what value that gets you uh, beyond 30 I suppose there are there's an answer to that question but I'm not sure what it actually what what anything beyond 60 gets you <clears throat> so I just I always run at 720p 30 cuz there's no need to go any higher than that near as I can tell anyway now maybe if you're going to be heavily processing the resulting video in some way that the extra the extra frames are helpful I suppose that could be a reason but in this case yeah, the only thing it gets you is CPU overload. Exactly. <laughs> it used it uses a lot more bandwidth and CPU, but I'm not sure the viewer actually notices anything different between 30 and 60. I suspect the 60 just gets you a bunch of extra frames if you're going to do some post processing of the video, because I can't imagine why where the what the extra 30 FPS gets certainly a viewer, but. Yeah, I really like I really like this imaging newt. You know, I mean it's you know, I mean th this little 6-inch imaging newt, you can pick them up for just a couple of hundred bucks used. Um and uh they work just really well. Uh in comparison to your your C8, your your Schmidt Cassegrain, um it's much simpler and it's much cheaper, but it's also single use. You know, it's designed for imaging, wide field, rich field, fast optics. Um, you know, it's it's that's what it's designed for, and then and so that's it's it's like a one-trick pony. Whereas your C8, like most Schmidt Cassegrains, um, is a jack of all trades. It is more expensive and complex and whatnot, but you can do a lot of different things with that. You have a lot of flexibility with uh, with an SCT. You can slow it down with um, Barlow's and do planetary work, whereas this imaging newt doesn't really do well with that. Or you can speed it up a lot and do, you know, the kinds of things that I'm doing with this. Maybe not quite as ideally, but you can do it. It's a very versatile scope, the C8 you have. And uh, so, pros and cons, but I'm kind of a one-trick pony anyway. I like doing my imaging, and that's all I'm really interested in, so for me, the newt is the best way to go. I'm not really interested in doing visual anymore. I don't really like doing solar system stuff, so for me, the imaging newt just made the most sense and also happens to be a great bang for the buck. So... <coughs> So I really like it. Yeah, the Helix is coming along pretty nice there. Of course, we've been at it for 16 and a half minutes, so that's uh, a good length of time. But I don't think I've ever done the Helix before. Not that I recall, anyway. <coughs> I don't recall that I've imaged this, at least not with this setup, not with the 533 and this newt. But it'll be very cool to get. Uh, it'll be very cool to image this again when I'm using flats, where the background won't be blown out. It'll be dark, and I'll be able to push the stretch even further and get a lot more pop out of it. That'll be fun. It'll be fun once I start running flats. Unfortunately, I can't really take a flat at night because I don't have any means for doing that. Uh, I know some people do use a white t-shirt and a light source, and uh, but I don't. I, I anyway, I have to look into how to do that. have any setup that can do that and I I know you can buy electroluminescent panels
that you can put over your opening of your scope, but those are those are silly expensive in my in my opinion for such a simple device. But uh so I won't bother to do that, but um the best way is right after sunset put the scope up around the median uh the meridian 10 or 15 degrees east of the meridian on a clear blue sky right after sunset and take your flats that's that's the best way i think only downside of course is it means you have to be set up before sunset which doesn't always work all right and now we got some breeze picking up here i don't know if you can hear it in the microphone but Definitely a little puff of breeze. Still not dropping any subs, though. Individual subs that are coming in are still doing pretty well. Darken that background a little bit. Boy, the breeze has really picked up here in the last uh, minute or two. Hopefully it'll be temporary. same same altitude as this is so I think we'll go take a look over there all right let's save this as viewed 20 minutes I think that's a pretty good uh, pretty good amount of time okay turn off the live stack Drop us down. <coughs> oh, oh, oh. And uh, move over to Sculptor. Yeah, 
sculptor is a pretty one. <coughs> pretty good. It's right in the view. Everything is a bit streaked, though. And yeah, we're definitely getting some... Yeah, look at how streaky that is. Definitely getting some breeze now. Hopefully it's just temporary, but if not, I may be driven inside. Okay. Huh. I'm not really sure why I'm seeing nothing without a big stretch. I should be seeing more than... Let's see what I get for a histogram stretch at 8 seconds. I would think I would at least be able to see stars, even at 1 second. But... Hey Jim, good evening. Um, sky conditions tonight. We had some overcast earlier. Um, it seems to have blown off. Um, and I literally mean blown off because we've had a little bit of breeziness. Which all for the last hour or so has calmed down. It's been pretty nice. But in the last few minutes here, all of a sudden it just picked up quite a bit. So... Um, skies are nice, breeze not so much at the moment. <coughs> well, let's see what I can do at 32 seconds. Let's see what I... see what we get for an image at 32 seconds. It's, uh... probably just going to be a streaky mess with all this wind. It has been, it's been pretty nice, you know, for the first 90 minutes or so, we would have some, uh, we definitely would have some puffs of breeze here or there, but this has just completely picked up here in the last few minutes. It seems to be, uh, sticking around, so... <coughs> yeah, get some streaky stars. <laughs> Try and live stack, but I don't know that it's going to. Oh shoot! No, don't do that. I need to do this. Sculptor Galaxy. Okay. Now yeah, we'll clear Helix out. <laughs> Got a satellite going right through our right through our 30 second exposure. <laughs> In fact, I'll just start that back over again. I'll just start right over again. We'll just get rid of that. Let's see what we can... Oh, ignored. Yeah, it ignored our first one. Yep, failed FWHM. Too blurry because of the wind. Let's we'll see how it does on the second one. <sighs> Nope, 
it ignored the second one. <clears throat> well, we can look at the individual frames and see what we got. sure why it's ignoring them. It's ignoring all of them, though. Well, I may just have to turn the filter off, because in this wind... <coughs> that's maybe all we get is crappy ones. got one. We got one, and it is, man, the stars are streaked and blurred because of, uh, <laughs> because of the wind. So I'm not sure we're going to be able to... I'll give this a few more minutes. Hopefully the wind will just die back down. Because it has been pretty nice. More or less, it has been pretty nice, but this breeze has been pretty consistent over the last five or five or six minutes. <clears throat> but the Sculptor Galaxy is a nice one. That's a nice, big, bright one. It's one of our locals, I believe. Not as local as Andromeda and Triangulum, but still. Yeah, the breeze seems to be calming down, so I'm going to clear this and start over again. I hope we can start with a with a good one that has a non-streaked has non-streaked stars in it. Not the breeze is calming back down again. Seeing and transparency. Um, transparency, well, like I said earlier, we had some high, thin cloudiness earlier, so the transparency wasn't great. It's uh, We're getting onshore flow. Uh, we're getting Pacific flow here. So, you know, it's still not perfect, the transparency. But it's pretty darn good. By the time the air gets out here to the desert, it usually is, dries out a bit. So the transparency is pretty good. Um, seeing, well, like I said, it is intermittently breezy right now, so the seeing is certainly not excellent. Um, definitely getting some twinkling of stars, but not bad. Uh, but definitely a little bit of twinkling. So I would say neither one is ideal, but uh, they're not terrible either. <coughs> Well, it looks like uh, the breeze is calming down. We actually might uh, might be getting some some stuff worth stacking here. We've got some relatively round stars there, still a little bit ovaled from the wind, but not too bad. You've lost audio. Hmm. I wonder if that means you dropped out or I dropped out. Hopefully it wasn't me, but I think everything's working here like the way it should, I think. <coughs> but the Sculptor Galaxy, let me look up. Let me look up what this... Uh, Look it up in Wikipedia, the Sculptor Galaxy. Also known as Silver Coin and Silver Dollar Galaxy, NGC 253, 
intermediate spiral and sculptor. It's a starburst galaxy, which means it is currently undergoing a period of star formation. Okay. Uh, it was discovered by Carolyn Herschel, 1783, during one of her comet searches. <coughs> and it was rediscovered by John Herschel. Uh, uh, well, actually not rediscovered. John Herschel, 50 years later, in his 18-inch metallic mirror reflector, Found, uh, observed it. Very bright and large, a superb object. Its light is somewhat streaky, but I see no stars in it except four large and one very small one. And these seem not to belong to it. There may, there being many near. Okay, yeah, so he was saying stars. So some of the stars that are in it, in our own galaxy, <coughs> he thought maybe they were in it, <coughs> but couldn't tell for sure. <coughs> <coughs> but sculptor is a nice is a nice uh nice image. It's a nice galaxy. It's a nice galaxy to view. Nineteen sixty one, Alan Sandage Sculptor Galaxy wrote that the Sculptor Galaxy is the prototype example of a special subgroup. Photographic images. Here comes that wind again. Jeez, I thought it was calming down. <coughs> Features starburst center of the Sculptor Galaxy is located in the center of the Sculptor Group. One of the nearest groups of galaxies to the Milky Way. Uh, the Sculptor Galaxy is in the group and one of the intrinsically brightest galaxies in the vicinity of ours, only surpassed by Andromeda and Sombrero. And the companion galaxies... Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Research suggests the presence of a supermassive black hole in the center of this galaxy with a mass estimated to be five million times that of our sun. <coughs> Yikes. At least two techniques have been used to measure the distance to Sculptor in the past ten years. Using the planetary nebula luminosity function method, an estimate of 10.89 million light years. Yeah, so it's less than 12 million light years, so that's definitely one of our local group. So somewhere between 10 and a half and 13 million light years. <coughs> Well, we're still stacking here. It's only dropped one sub, but still. But, uh, <coughs> the breeze has definitely picked up here. Still again. I thought it was calming back down, and it has picked back up again. And I've been going for a couple of hours anyway, so it's probably probably about a good time to call it anyhow, because this breeze seems like it's not going to let up. Of course, I know what's going to happen. I'll close the stream down and pack up and move in, and as soon as I do, the breeze will stop. Such is the curse of astronomy. But this is a pretty cool little object. It's even more fun to do with the mono camera because <coughs> uh, galaxies respond really well to mono cameras, more so than color. But uh, it's definitely big enough and bright enough that uh, it's worthy of a color camera. <coughs> but 
That's pretty sweet. Again, I'm not getting very round stars right now, but uh, in this breeze, I'm amazed that I'm I'm amazed that I'm only dropping like 15% of my subs. <laughs> actually stacking about a good 85% of them so I'm actually uh, I'm actually quite impressed with my new uh, pier and wedge setup here especially considering the massive amount of money I spent on it which was about $15 in hardware it's uh, working pretty darn nicely and uh, I really love that I can just leave it out polar aligned and set up and it's very quick and easy to just come out and attach the mount to the wedge, attach the scope to the mount, do a star sense auto align and I'm imaging. It's quick, easy, and uh, I don't have to mess with polar alignment. It just stays polar aligned. So that's a very cool thing for me. And it seems to be doing much better than I would expect in a breeze like this. Normally, in a breeze like this, I wouldn't even bother to come out. But the forecast, quite incorrectly, was stating that the breeze was supposed to decrease this evening, not increase. So clearly they got that wrong. Anyway, this was a good one to finish off on. It's a nice target. And it's been, well, this time last year. Last, uh, last spring, I think, was the last time I shot this one. It's one of my favorites. One of my favorite galaxies. It just has such nice cloud structure in it. And uh, it's big, it's bright. It's a nice one to spend some time on. Tomorrow night is Gary's show, but Sunday night I might come out with the, the mono and do another another live stream on Sunday night <coughs> with the mono and <coughs> hit some galaxies. In fact, what I may end up doing is the, uh, the Cloudy Nights Observer's Challenge. <clears throat> on uh, on Sunday night, and that is mostly galaxies. So I may just make Sunday night a mono night, and uh, and play with uh, play with some galaxies on Sunday night. The good news is the next few nights are supposed to be some pretty uh, pretty nice weather. This breeze is supposed to disappear this evening. And uh, the next few nights are looking pretty nice. So hopefully, Gary, that translates to you. Um, also, uh, <coughs> having a good night tomorrow night. I know it's supposed to be gorgeous here. It's supposed to be kind of like this, except no wind and warm. So hopefully that'll translate to your show tomorrow, Gary, and you'll uh, you'll have some really nice weather down there. Looking forward to see what... Uh, See what you see. Looking forward to see what you can show us. You're welcome, Randy. Appreciate you stopping by. Thanks for coming. I don't know if you can hear the wind on my microphone, but it's definitely, uh, definitely picked up in the last 15 or so minutes, so I'm going to call it a night. But, uh, been fun. I have managed to get more than 10 minutes, though, on Sculptor, which is a, a surprise. I don't think I'm even going to bother to keep this picture because it's not... The stars are too overly, but it's not worth keeping, but uh, it's... Uh, maybe I'll come back on Sunday night and get this. You're welcome, Frank. <coughs> Good to see you, and uh, thanks for stopping by. Set up. I will be probably back on Sunday night. We'll see what happens. But uh, 
yeah, subscribe to my channel, and then you'll be notified whenever I have uh, when I have one. And uh, in the meantime, tomorrow night, everybody tune in for Gary's show. Gary and Dave Decker, and we'll see what uh, what the Gary and Dave have to show us tomorrow night from San Diego. That'll be fun. But anyway, yeah, I think I'm going to call it a night. So let's shrink this back down and turn off our live stack. And uh, I think I will just end the stream. So thank you, everybody, for showing up. And uh, I will see you next time. I'll send out an email and whatnot letting you know. But uh, I will see you guys next time. So thanks for coming. Good night, everybody, from Death Valley.